five. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for another LA Unified STEAM Bytes. My name is Jerry, and I'm joined by Jaspreet, who will be introducing today's guest. Jaspreet? Thanks, Jerry. Today's guest speaker is considered a rock star of math education. Dan Meyer is a former high school math teacher who has advocated for better math instruction and has inspired many teachers to change their teaching methods. Dan has been featured on CNN, Good Morning America, Every Day with Rachel Ray, and has done a TED Talk about what's wrong with math instruction and how to improve it. He has earned his doctorate from Stanford University and is currently the Chief Academic Officer for Desmos. Please welcome Dan Meyer. Hey, thanks for the invitation, Jerry, and the intro, just breed. Uh, hello to all you folks out there in YouTube land. It's a pleasure to be here with you folks talking about STEAM careers and what that might look like. Um, if you're someone who thinks that the term rock star in math education is kind of a contradiction or an oxymoron, I, I, I get that. That uh, makes a lot of sense to me. So no, no uh, hard feelings there. Um, I just have like a few ideas for you to think about as you're planning out your career and the possibilities. I want to make a pitch for teacher, uh, science, math, art, STEAM, um, as a really interesting career option and share with you a little bit about where I, I've been and what I've seen and what I've learned on the way. I'll just say um, I did not want to be a teacher initially coming out of school. Um, teaching for a lot of kids lacks the glam factor to some degree, um, certainly not like uh, being an astronaut or a um, professional athlete of some sort. And I was also a third generation teacher um, by the end of it. Like my dad taught for 34 years and um, sixth grade. And, uh, he, you know, he worked very hard and, um, you know, did not encourage me to become a teacher for, I think, like a lot of really good reasons. Like it's a, it's a tough job in lots of ways. Um, and I like a lot, of, like a lot of kids didn't want to be my dad. I want to be my own person. So I was not interested in going to the, to the school that he went to UC Davis or being a teacher, which he was, and I wound up doing both. Um, so that's, um, part of what I want to just like share is to, um, you know, plan as little as possible about life to whatever degree you can keep your plans open, um, and not try to over-engineer life. I think that you might be happier. Um, I certainly have been, um, that extends to like college and career choice. Um, and even further, like I, I, I really wanted to be a, um, uh, an author, uh, a movie writer, a director, a uh, writer director. I loved movies. Um, I was uh, in college. I studied math. I was a math major, and I um, did didn't do great as a math major. Like I, my grades were not exceptional. I didn't learn loads of math at the university level because, I, in part, because I was spending loads of time entering screenplays into competition and filming little videos, and that was that was the thing. Like I was into that, and um, at a certain point, it became clear like I was much more skilled as a math teacher uh, or in mathematics than I was at writing or directing movies. And so I went into a math career as a math teacher. And I want to say that um, what wound up happening for me is that this other major interest of mine, storytelling, um, wound up becoming the foundation of what I do in math teaching. Um, I explore like what, why people, students, kids, everyone seems to enjoy movies and um, books and video games much more than they enjoy math class. And if you talk to a teacher who knows of my work, they'll, they might refer to a project called Three Act Math, which is where I filmed little mathematical stories in my life and I put them on the internet and shared them with people and we all got together around them. And so I just wanna offer you that like, you might feel as though at different points in your career journey that you were saying so long goodbye um, to various other interesting hobbies or interests or aspirations you have, but um, everything you are, becomes integrated at a certain point that all of your hobbies and loves and aspirations and interests, they will find, find their way into whatever career you choose. So again, I encourage you not to plan too much. Um, and teaching is great for so many reasons. I offer that as a possible place for you to put your energy. Um, it offers you community in ways that um, very few jobs will offer you. Uh, many jobs are um, very competitive. You're isolated by yourself or on a small team, perhaps. With teaching, you know, there's a principal, there's some assistant principals, but below that, there's just like a bunch of people trying to figure it out together. 
And that kind of community is extremely hard to come by and uh, ever more so uh, in the 21st century. So I offer you that. Um, I offer you that uh, teaching gives you stability. There's a lot of stability in teaching. It's a very good job in lots of ways, financially, time-wise, um, benefits, like the stuff you need to do life. It has a lot to offer. And in that stability comes room for you to wonder questions. It gives you space. Your brain's not focused on like, where will I get healthcare? I think you might not care about now as a teenager or someone who's young, but like it, it will matter. And there's so much stability there that you can then free up your, your mental, uh, you know, your headspace, your mind to think and wonder and answer interesting questions, which is how I spent my time as a teacher. Um, I'll offer you one other idea. This is two of three. And that is just that you are playing the game right now. There is this idea of a lot of students I taught and a lot of my classmates when I was in school that like once I graduate, um, then like I'm in, I'm in it. I'm in the game. Like I'm like put me in coach and then I'll start like figuring out how to be in the world. And um, then it's like you're in, you're in college. And it's like, well, after I graduate college, like, then I'm in the game. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what, how, to, how to act out there in the world and what my thing is, what my, what my vibe is. And um, I just want to offer you that you are, you are actively in the world right now as a student. And the things you are doing now, habits, behaviors, ways of thinking, ways of being, will only get easier. Uh, for you, whatever those are. Like if, if you are, you know, a curious individual, if you chase down questions, um, that will become a thing that you will carry with you throughout all of your different other spheres you'll be in in the world. And if you get used to, I don't know, like uh, uh, not chasing down questions, the work ethics and habits you're developing now, that is who you are right now. You are in the game right now. And, and I, I wish I'd known that sooner. Um, but yeah, just check that, like check what you're doing now, whatever that is, will only get easier, um, as scary and as fun as that sounds. Um, I would, uh, I'll let you know what I do now. Um, I was a teacher for um, six or seven years, and um, then I went to graduate school, and I just, I had questions. I think one thing I am is a curious individual. I, I love questions. Give me a question, and I will gnaw on it like a bone. And uh, I'm very curious. And so I wanted to know more about like, wow, this is such a fascinating uh, profession. Like why do some students really struggle to learn math and others learn math really easily teaching so weird. Like, like I'm, I'm, I, I call, you know, I, I, I require 150 kids to call me Mr. Meyer, you know, like there's this weird power imbalance. Um, like, what is that about? Like, we get along, we don't get along. What, what makes the difference? So I, I went to graduate school and chased down answers to those things. And um, all, all along the whole way, teaching graduate school, I was writing little blog posts, um, sharing those online, and um, getting a community of people around me who were helping me grow as a teacher. And I encourage you to find that kind of community uh, wherever you are, whatever you do. Find people who um, share what you're into, share your questions somehow, and then um, see who comes along and invests in you and, and, sh and return that investment to other people later. And um, along the way, I gave a talk I, my career had a very viral moment where I, sh I took 11 minutes on a stage in New York in May in, I, I want to say 2010, um, 11 years ago. And that went on a website called TED.com. And that was that talk had been watched millions of times um, about math education and what's challenging about it and what we could do differently, especially in the area of the textbooks we use. And um, that was weird. That was weird to go viral like that. And so I've been um, around the world. I've been on you know, a bunch of different continents, all the US states, talking with math teachers, working with them, sharing ideas with them, trading ideas back and forth. That's been a ride. And um, I couldn't do it again. I couldn't, I couldn't manufacture that whole thing. But um, you know, I, I do know that the foundation of it came from being curious sharing what I was curious about, sharing my early answers, getting answers from other people and, um, you know, being grateful for their answers. And then, you know, an opportunity came, I stepped into that. So then, then um, what I've done since then is work at one place called Desmos, um, which is what, uh, it's an ed tech company. It's a technology company. When I, when I um, started up there, um, they had a, just a, a single technology product, a graphing calculator of the sort you might have used, um, you know, a, a kind of a plastic job in your classes. Um, but it is, uh, we, they, they use, they had one that's online. It was uh, digital and free and very powerful. There's uh, folks that love technology and uh, love math and had a lot of love for education too. And I stepped in as someone who knew a lot about education. Um, that was my expertise, not technology. 
And um, so since then, we've been building experiences for students in math class. And so here's what that looks like, just so we're all on the same page here. So like right here, um, you know, learning about graphs and functions. Um, here is a turtle race. I press play right here and nothing is happening because I have graphed nothing. Um, what I can do here is start to graph things like I can graph um, a line that looks like this and then press play and see what happens. And we have a turtle going slow forward and then faster backwards and then really fast going forwards all the way like that. Those little, little legs skittering around. Um, and so uh, this is the sort of experience that I got excited about where students would do a thing um, and math would talk back to them. They would Students would give an idea out there into the world and math would return back, not you're right, you're wrong, um, but that uh, this means something in the world. I, uh, I encourage you as item number three um, to stay curious, but also stay a little bit angry. Um, like, like I'm saying before, like whatever you do gets easier to do. Whatever you think about gets easier to think about. And so if you are a curious individual, um, there's ways that you and the world can conspire to smush your curiosity, to throw water on whatever fire has burned inside you around different questions, um, that can stop. Like that can very easily stop. And um, curiosity is a thing that you can nurture too. I find nothing nurtures curiosity by experiencing a question and chasing down an answer. And then your brain is free to wonder more questions. I'll talk more about that in a second. I also think that being angry is, anger is not in my mind a, um, a vice. It's sometimes a virtue that um, you know, being really unhappy with how things are can serve you really well. It served me really well. I think there's a lot of people that, um, I don't know about a lot, but some people would say Dan is not nice. Um, people who've you know, read me online or don't know me, folks who do know me sometimes, uh, would say Dan's not a nice person. Nice is probably not in the top 10 uh, adjectives. Some people might use to describe me, um, and, but that, that I, I feel angry uh, a lot about the state of things and that can be really helpful. Uh, it can help you generate ideas of what you might do next. Um, you know, imagine you were transported back in time, 50 years, you know, think about what isn't there 50 years ago. Think about how the world is 50 years ago, the kinds of technologies you wouldn't have, the kinds of um, relationships that you wouldn't have with other people that you love. Um, think about how angry that would make you and understand that now, right now is 50 years ago uh, from some time 50 years in the future. Like 50 years in the future will happen because people are angry about how things are now, unhappy with it anyway. And so me, I've been very unhappy uh, in my life, in my career about this, that if you Google um, in, a, in a browser, why am I bad at science, history, English, and math, you get back search results, which kind of reflect the number of times people have written that out there on the internet. Like, why am I bad at math? And, um, and the results here are just astonishing to me um, that very few people have created web pages, you know, or written on the internet. Why am I bad at science, history, English? But with math, it's in the tens of thousands. And that that makes me angry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just does. Like we require children to spend you know, 12 years of their only childhood learning about math, a uh, thing that many of them just feel bad at, that makes them feel demoralized. And you know, it's, it's a whole system. I don't blame teachers or curriculum or any one thing, but this makes me angry. And so that's, that anger has motivated me to do a lot of different things, try a lot of different things um, in my career. So I, I invite you to think about what makes you upset or angry or unhappy and to, practice doing something about it. And, you know, your kid, I'm not gonna say kids can't change the world, but things change a bit as you get older. And, um, you know, whatever, like whatever impact you'll make as a kid about your anger, about your thing you're un unhappy about, like, that's great. But the really important part is that it trains you, it, it habituates you, creates a habit of like chasing after things you're angry about and trying to do something about them. And uh, so that's, that is part of why I love this sort of task right here, you know, where it's like, I've seen students that like, to my mind, very clearly have not felt successful in math class who would type in, why am I bad at math into Google or whatever? And they come to this screen and I've seen this happen. They'll like draw themselves a, you know, just like a smiley face. Like that's what they do here. And what, what, what I'm helping to create are experiences where this actually has meaning. When I press play here, something's gonna happen. It's not gonna tell the student, hey, you're bad at math or even you're wrong. 
it's going to do a thing that the student can learn about and about math and also learn like, hey, I'm kind of creative. Um, so what's going to happen here? What do you think? Let's do it. If you said multiple turtles, you are right on. What is the maximum number of turtles we're going to see here? The most turtles. Uh, yep, yep. And then back. And then more. And then back. And crawling back together. And then gone. And these experiences compound over the course of a year, over the course of a school career. And we're seeing students with our work feel less bad at math. Feel less less stupid, less alone, less like uh, they're they're misunderstood. So that's the work I'm up to at Desmos, including supporting teachers at making good use of moments like this right here. Uh, math is a great way to exercise your curiosity. It's a great way to exercise your anger too, um, if, depending on what you're angry about. I'll say one question, an example of like how the lengths one can go to chase down curiosity. Um, I was curious at one point in college, like, are there any world records out there that I could break? And so I just like looked through the whole Guinness Book of World Records and I saw one I thought looked a little bit soft, maybe. And so I tried to practice um, breaking it at a small scale. The record was the longest paperclip chain made in 24 hours, a full day. That's what you got available to you. Just you chaining paperclips. You can have folks that are, you know, uh, giving you a back massage or you know, feeding you water, but it's just you chaining paperclips. I was like, huh. It was a huge number. Like it was thousands of paper clips, tens of thousands. I was like, this seems big, but also like it might not be that much. And so I went, I just like started practicing here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this up here. So yeah, I started practicing. I was like, uh, you know, I was like, so how do you how do you do this? And I was like trying to thread it around, you know, as you do, as you do, you know what I'm talking about. You've done this before. And that took a while to do that. That was a long time. And I started, started just like playing around a little more and I found a different way to do it. I'd like take the big loop, put that over the little- Hi, Dan. Hi, this is Jerry. Sorry, Jerry. would you mind um, uh, not sharing your screen so we can see your- Oh, see yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I mean, I, I would like take this right here and uh, fit the big loop right here over the little loop right there. And then bam, just like that. Yep. And just practicing and pretty soon, like I was doing some math on it. I was like, okay, so here's what I can do. Number of paper clips per second wise. Let me see if this will uh, pull up right here. Is this, is this go time? Is this uh, who got this here? Let me see. Yep. There it is. Yeah. Um, and so just the, the, that mathematics offered me this, that, that I would say, like, if I could do, um, I could do, you know, uh, one, uh, one clip, let's say. So, I gotta share my screen again. I gotta share my screen one more time here. Yep, here we go. We're back. So I can do uh, one clip uh, every two seconds, and we've got you know sixty seconds in a minute, and sixty minutes in an hour, one hour, and twenty four hours in a day. And I also was like, oh, but you gotta like multiply that by like I don't know, like. 80% because there's no way that the pace that I could go chaining paper clips, um, you know, like over a minute long or an, even an hour, I could sustain that over 24 hours. So you knock that down a little bit. And uh, at the end of this, all this math right here, you know, uh, let me see here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of this thing. Um, at, the end of, at the end of that, I got some kind of number right here. And it was, it was like larger than the number of clips that was the world record, even with that 80% uh, discount right there. So um, I went ahead and I, uh, I beat the thing. I asked Office Depot to send me paper clips in exchange for wearing their t-shirt. They did that. I got friends that pushed paper clips towards me. You know, they signed up for shifts. Uh, you know, every hour for 24 hours, I stayed up. I was just like caffeinated to the max, watch some movies, watch some TV, all that. And, uh, broke that record and it's still standing almost 20 years later. And I, I offer this, this is like self-evidently silly, right? This is like a silly thing. I just offer this as the links I've tried to go to, to respond when my brain comes up with an idea of a thing to do or a question that's a little wacky or seems unanswerable, I know that I've got to answer it. Or eventually that, you know, whatever spirit, fairy, 
dwarf that comes along invisibly and offers questions to people. Like if I just kind of brush that thing away, eventually it'll go somewhere else is what I've always worried about. So I'm offering you folks at, at this moment, like whatever questions kind of pop into your head, whatever interesting thing, chase that down. Um, yeah, so let me see. I think that's it. One way of doing things in the STEM, plan as little as possible. Understand that like your hobbies and interests, there's ways to integrate them into whatever your career winds up being. Uh, understand that like this is not, if you're a student right now, this is not a scrimmage. This is not a practice drill. Like you're doing life right now and you're developing habits and ways of being in the world that uh, will only get easier, which is great if they're good and unfortunate if they're not. So take it seriously, like you're in it. Um, and I'm inviting you to definitely stay curious. And if it's cool with your parents and teachers and other people in your life, also stay angry a little bit too, because uh, that anger can just generate a lot of interesting ideas, responses to injustice in the world. And maybe as one closing idea, I love that this is the, this is a steam bite um, with the A for arts um, that maybe this says, this says STEM right here, but uh, honestly, like STEM, people are gonna go into STEM more and more. There'll be more people that are comfortable with the real hard numerical quantitative programmery, you know, abstract skills the people who will distinguish themselves, who distinguish themselves right now, are the people who can do all that. Plus, they know how to write. They know how to think about uh, history. They know how to be artistic in that work, how to bring a flair to the work. Um, so, again, that's that, that integration of all of the disciplines, the hobbies and the profession. It's all in there. So, um, I'm Dan. I work at Desmos. Love STEAM. Love math. Love art. All of the above. Um, get at me on Twitter, at Needy Meyer, or Dan at Desmos. Let me know what you're thinking about. And uh, uh, just Preet and Jerry, thanks a mil for having me on. Thank you, Dan, so much. Um, and I know this is something different than you normally do because I've seen you at a lot of conferences and um, you know, you inspire many math educators. Um, and in today's talk, it's something different. You actually gave a lot of advice to our students about, you know, plan as little as possible, you know, understand that they're playing a game and then to stay angry, to have that passion in them. But when it comes to parents, what advice would you give to parents to support, you know, their kids in doing those three, um, you know, for doing those three goals that you have, that you've been sharing? Oh, yeah. Great question. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're a parent, I definitely did not recommend to your children that they should be angry. That was not a thing I did. That was from Jaspreet. So address all of your um, complaints to Jaspreet at LASD.net or whatever the email address is. Uh, but yeah, so like I... I am, I'm a parent, I, uh, two very small children, toddlers, and it's given me a certain perspective on like this part of life. And I would just say that um, it's pretty easy to put students in, put kids into a, a real neat, turn, turn school into a real meat grinder of kind of achievement and stress and a concern that if I don't take this class, um, you know, at the right time from right, the right teacher, the right place that I'll, I'll, I'm destined to be destitute. Um, that if I don't get in the right school or college, that like I'll, I'll never be anything. And I, that, that I feel that, like I feel nervous about like the food that my small children are putting in their bodies. Like, is this, is this the right food? Is this like, a, what should I be doing right now? And I think that one risk, if, even if you made all the right choices, um, that one risk there is becoming this sort of person who um, just like really optimizes hard and like makes people, makes kids, uh, makes yourself nervous about every decision versus I'm, I'm trying to be someone who's like can relax about things that are worth relaxing about. And in doing so, give my kids space to not worry, space to think and dream. Um, and, and a big part of that I think is like rushing through math. There's a, a real interest in like, oh, you know, like getting into algebra in eighth grade, or, you know, I need to have my kid in second year algebra as a, as a freshman in high school. So that therefore they can be in third year calculus, you know, as a senior, which they'll take at the local junior college, giving them a leg up for college and so on and so on. And um, again, I, I just think, I think that like a, that creates a lot of stress. It turns math into from, it converts math from a, a joyous way to ask and answer questions. Um, over into an, just an instrument of, you know, financial, material, and academic success, which is kind of sad. 
Um, and also like that rush really sets kids up for failure, especially at the university. Like when we rush through a lot of the foundational mathematics, like mm -hmm. some of the, the you know, proportional reasoning in sixth and seventh and eighth, like those are, those are huge ideas. Like that thing you saw me doing on that uh, iPad there, like that's a, that's a big time math right there. Um, thinking about thinking proportionally. Um, and so spending extra time, uh, not rushing to, to eighth grade algebra, but like go slow and make sure students really understand like, what is a variable? I know, I know kids can like operate with the variables. They can do all the, all the operations that the, te that the testing centers and the tutoring centers will, will show them how to do. Like, what is a variable? What does an equal sign even mean? What are we doing here? Um, the, that is the sort of thing that's um, more important than getting to third year calculus with a fragile understanding of all of the above, uh, which winds up crumbling um, in college. That's just one idea. It's a hard job though. Uh, don't hear me as being judgmental here. I'm also trying to figure it out alongside you folks. No, I, I'm the same way. I have a little child as well. Um, and then when you, I know you've shared a lot of, um, of information with teachers, but what is one piece of advice that you would give to teachers out of everything that you've done in your career? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge one. Um, I, yeah, just one off the top is just to really, um, that I want my work to testify to, you know, what it is I love about math. And I, school for all things are so great about being a teacher or being in school, there's, there's just like a lot of, there's a lot of routine. There's the bells, there's the days, there's the rhythms of the seasons, there's the summer, there's standards, there's assessments. It can become really easy, easy I think. I felt this over even a relatively short amount of time I was a teacher. It can become easy to forget about your why, like, your, like what it is you love about what you teach um, and uh, to kind of like follow those rhythms instead. And it takes active discipline, I think to stay connected to. For me, I loved doing math in the world, doing like paperclip type stuff. And so I needed to like work extra hard to stay connected to that. So I could be a happy teacher. So I could bring that into my classrooms. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, Jerry and I appreciate it. And I know our teachers, our parents and their students of LA Unified appreciate it. And well, as many of, um, the universities because we've also invited um, aspiring teachers to be here today as well. So thank you so much. And thank you for our viewers today. Um, our next Steam Bites is May 12th and we have um, Dr. Casey Quigley and we also have um, Dr. Danielle Herr talking about transdisciplinary instruction and their path on how they became professors at Pittsburgh University. So thank you once again and we will see you May 12th. Oh, we are done.